Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series has been on the book of Ephesians. Remember that small book in the middle of the New Testament? It's only six chapters long. We have 14 lessons on that six chapters. So we're going to dig in a little bit deeper than normal. This is lesson number 13 in that series for September 23 of 2023. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we recognize your presence among us and we realize how much help we need in understanding these very challenging portions of Scripture. Paul had a lot of time to think. He was in prison. We don't know exactly what his prison circumstances were, but he was no doubt guarded by one or multiple uh, Roman soldiers and not, uh, not, not much opportunity for getting exercise or moving around. And so he sat down and he thought these things through and he produced this book that he intended to go to the churches, all the churches in Western Asia Minor, what's now modern Turkey. So Lord, help us to look at it in that context and understand it as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, military equipment is much talked about. What place does such equipment have in the lives of Christians? In this lesson, we will talk about the strange weapons and protections that Paul outlined as being appropriate for Christians as a group as they are fitting not for war, but for peace. And that's why our lesson caused waging peace. Let us be clear, we are engaged in the greatest war of all time. <clears throat> we may not be, you know, carrying swords or even guns or whatever like that, but it's, it's a war. <clears throat> Furthermore, this war is a war to the death. One side will be completely destroyed and the other side will live forever. Which side do you want to be on? <laughs> Moreover, we already know which side will win, which is amazing. The life and death of Jesus Christ gives us a clear choice. <clears throat> we can choose to live a life as closely as possible to the kind of life he lived, or we will die the death he died, separated from the Father, who is the only source of life. By following the example of Jesus Christ, we place ourselves on God's side, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, by following the customs of the world, we will die the death of which Satan is the preeminent cause, separated from God, who is the only source of life. So why does the Bible talk about individual items of armor and protection? Why doesn't he talk about, you know, airplanes and bombers and tanks and all that kind of stuff? Well, there's a good reason. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. Jim? From the Bible study guide, by listing and describing the armor of God as individual items, that is a belt, a breastplate, shoes, shield, helmet, sword, Paul does not mean to depict a lonely warrior. On the contrary, in Greek, he uses the verbs in the second person, plural, to address an entire army. Number one, you, in the plural, in the plural be strong, Ephesians 6.10. Number two, you, in the plural, put on the armor of God, Ephesians 6.11. Number three, so that you, in the plural, may be able to resist, that is in Ephesians 6.11, for, for our, obviously plural here, struggle, Ephesians 6.12. For number five, you, that is plural, take up the complete armor, Ephesians 6.13, and you, in plural, stand, number, excuse me, stand number firm. Six, but yeah. Right? Number six there. Yeah, number six, you, that is in the plural, stand firm. In fact, all our most, excuse me, all or most of the other verbs Paul uses in addressing the church here are in the plural form. God's glorious army of brave soldiers fully equipped for their mission. This is from the Bible study guide for, I guess. So in, in order to really understand why Paul is talking like this, you need to understand a little bit about how the Greeks fought a war. <clears throat> 
those of you who, who are medical in the medical field know that we call these fingers, what do we call them? Phalanges. Phalanges. That phalange word comes straight from Greek. And what the Greeks did is they all lined up like this, and the guys in the front would be down with sort of crouched over a little, and they'd be carrying, they would be carrying spears or, or even lances, long lances, and then the people behind them would be right behind them with their spears sort of resting on, I mean, their lances resting on their shoulders, and other people right behind them. So you you can't get to the army. You all you you're faced with a just a, a, a barrage of of lances, and they would just march forward like that. And, and what could you do? So that's what he's talking about, and he's saying, you, know, you people are marching all together. Obviously, in a deal like that, you can't be you know, oh, lagging behind or going forward. I mean, everybody has to move right together. So that's the kind of army and military situation that Paul is talking about. So do we understand very clearly what the mission of this army is? Now, soldiers usually have a reason for fighting. Carrie? But what is the army's mission? God's soldiers are armored and ready to proclaim to the universe a message from him. The message that God brings peace to the universe, to the people on earth, peace among the nations, peace in the communities, in the families, between generations and classes. But this peace is not a peace achieved because of compromise or syncretism in which all the parties in the conflict secure the acceptance of a piece of their own worldview. Values or project, and then that's what we often see, isn't it? If there's some kind of a war, and then there's some kind of a peace, well, then your side gets something, and the other side gets something. No, God can't compromise. Yeah, rather, God brought peace by revealing His love and justice at the cross, and thus winning the battle against His accusers and enemies. When people embrace what the Lord Jesus accomplished at the cross. God joyously blesses them with Christ's righteousness. It is this righteousness and love that brings peace between humans and God, between people and the entire universe. Wow. It is this peace that Christians proclaim. The history of the nations, of religions, of culture, of philosophy, of psychology, and of science has shown that there is no other way to achieve peace. Because Christians have experienced this peace themselves in their individual lives, in their families, in their communities, and in their church, they now can proclaim it to the entire humanity, indeed to the entire universe. And this is a really important point that Paul brings up probably more strongly in this little tiny book than any other small section of the Bible. The, it, the great controversy involves who? the entire universe. That's in Ephesians 1, it's in Ephesians 3, and so forth, as we'll see. We've already seen in several lessons. So, how about it? Do you think of the church as a unified army? From Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, build up your strength in union with the Lord and by means of His mighty power. Put on all the armor that God gives you so that you will be able to stand up against the devil's evil tricks. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. So put on God's armor now. Then, when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist the enemy's attacks, and after fighting to the end, you will still hold your ground. So stand ready. The truth is a belt tight around your waist with righteousness as your breastplate and as your shoes, the readiness to announce the good news of peace. At all times, carry faith as a shield, for with it you will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one, and accept salvation as a helmet, and the word of God as the sword which the Spirit gives you. Do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. For this reason, keep alert and never give up. Pray always for all God's people. And pray also for me, that God will give me a message when I am ready to speak, so that I may speak boldly and make known the gospel secret. For the sake of this gospel, I am an ambassador, though now I am in prison. 
pray that I may be bold in speaking about the gospel as I should. From American Study Book. And where, where was Paul when this happened, when he wrote this book? Jailed. Yeah. He was in prison, waiting. Every morning when he woke up, he realized it was possible he, if Nero suddenly had a quirk in his mind or something like this, he could have Paul, Paul's neck, neck cut off. He knew that every every day, <clears throat> so and he's writing this kind of stuff. Mm. It's amazing, just amazing. And then he's he's talking about getting ready to present his case to this very one who, if he doesn't like you for some reason, just chop his head off. Remember that this conflict started in heaven, and it is about the character and government of God. God is waiting for a group of people to correctly represent him as his son did during his life on this earth to prove to the entire universe that love can motivate better than selfishness and that serving others with love is the only way to govern a universe at peace. We live in a very different world than the one Paul lived in. He was describing war in terms that he understood. So now let's see if we can understand what he was talking about. There were no airplanes, no armored ships, no tanks, not even any guns. So let us try to get an idea of what war was like in Paul's day so that we can understand his call to arms. From our Bible study guide, it says, puts it in these words, victory in Greek and Roman warfare was, in, was dependent on the cooperation of the soldiers. As I mentioned a little while ago, everybody has to move together in a military unit and especially in their support for each other. In the heat of battle, individualism in battle was regarded as a characteristic of barbarian warriors, dooming them to defeat. You know, if you're out there fighting by yourself, you don't have a chance. There are important reasons to support the idea that Paul, in, this, in line with this usual military understanding, is primarily addressing the church's shared battle against evil in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 that Jennifer read, us, read for us so nicely. So one, the passage is the climax of a letter that is all about the church. It would be strange for Paul to conclude his letter with a picture of a lone Christian warrior doing battle against the foes of darkness. This wouldn't make any sense at all. Two, at the end of the passage, Paul highlights Christian camaraderie in his call to prayer for all the saints. He's praying for all the saints. This isn't just on one person to each, by himself. Three, most significant of all, earlier in the letter when Paul discusses the powers of evil, he places them over against the church, not the individual believer, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Well, rulers and authorities. So we read it in Ephesians 3.10 from our Good News Bible, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. From our Good News Bible. And then chapter 1, verse 7 to 10, more of that same kind of idea. For by the blood, notice footnote, by the blood or by the sacrificial death of Christ, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which he gave to us in such, such large measure. Now we could spend the evening discussing how God's death sets us free and forgives us, but we don't have time for that. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us, the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan which God will complete when the time is right is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and earth with Christ as head. So, and in Philippians, which he's going to write a short time after he writes, uh, after he wrote uh, Ephesians and Colossians together, he says, finally, at the end, every knee will bow, even including Satan. Mm -hmm. Everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Well, here in Colossians, which was written at the same time as Ephesians, he goes on, for it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. So there was, God knew that it was coming. They went on for hundreds of years in the early years of Christianity, arguing about whether Christ was fully God and only partly human, or 
fully human and only partly God. I mean, you couldn't be fully human and fully God at the same time. It just didn't seem possible. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to Himself. God made peace through His Son's blood, and that, again, through His sacrificial death on the cross, and so brought back to Himself all things, both on earth and in heaven, from the Good News Bible. So, if we have some solution to the great controversy that doesn't include the entire universe, we're missing a very important part of the whole picture. So, again, this war involves the whole universe. The only rebellious spot in the universe that is left is our world. The rest of the whole universe is waiting for us to get our act together, no, to discover the truth. In the book of Ephesians, Paul was emphasizing the idea of unity. So in this greatest war of all time, the church must stand together, a unified body against the evil forces. How can we help each other in this war? Jim? Paul's warning of an intense battle in Ephesians 6.13 prepares readers for the final call to, excuse me, to stand his fourth, excuse me, his stand, his, 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 his fourth call. He said, here's a call, and this is the okay. fourth time okay. he's called. Compare Ephesians 6, 11, and 13. And it is a detailed call to arms in Ephesians 6, 14 to 17. Paul describes the action of girding up one's waist, that is, compare Isaiah 11, 5, ancient loose-fitting garments needed to be tied up around the waist before work or b battle, compare Luke 12, 35 and 37, and also Luke 17, verse 8. Paul imagines the believer suiting up in armor as would a Roman legionnaire, beginning with a leather military belt with its decorative belt plates and buckle. From the belt hung a number of leather straps covering, excuse me, covered with metal discs together form an apron worn as a badge of honor, excuse me, badge of rank for visual effect. It served the essential function of tying up the garments and holding other items in place. Okay, let me, let me interrupt there for a moment. I don't know how many of you have seen a picture of one of these Roman legionnaires, but this is a, they didn't want to have a, a tight, like, leather skirt or something like that, or even leather pants, because it would restrict their movements. So they had simple our garments underneath, just undergarments, but then they had all these leather straps pretty wide, and then these leather straps in turn are covered with metal, little metal medallions and so forth. So it was almost like wearing a metal skirt. Okay? Truth is not the believer's own. It is a gift of God, compare salvation in Ephesians 2, 8. It is not, excuse me, it is not, though, to remain abstract, a distinct asset without any transforming impact on their lives. They are to be put on God's truth, to experience and use the divine gift. They do not so much possess God's truth as God's truth possesses and protects them. Paul's, Paul next urges believers to put on breastplates of righteousness, compare 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. Take the belt of truth, it is of divine origin, being part of the air, armor, of Yahweh in his role as divine warrior, warrior Isaiah 59, 17. Let me interrupt again. You can see, if you look through here, that Paul is quoting himself repeatedly, but he's also quoting Isaiah. He likes to quote Isaiah from the Old Testament with many of these same pictures. Okay? The body armor used by soldiers in Paul's day was made of small that is, yeah. it's going to be made of male, small intertwined iron rings, sc scale. scale armor, small overlapping scales of bronze or iron, or bands of covering, oh, excuse me, bands of overlapping iron fastened together. This body armor or breastplate protected the vit vital organs from the blows and th thrusts of the enemy. In an analogous way, 
believers are to experience the spiritual protection offered by God's protective gift of righteousness. In Ephesians, Paul associates righteousness with holiness, goodness, and truth, Ephesians 4, 24, and Ephesians 5, 9. Thinking of it as the quality of treating others justly and well, especially fellow church members from the Bible study guide. Okay, so we see that basically these people are, are almost completely protected by metal. And that's what gave them a quite a, an advantage in, in, in fighting. Okay, Kerry? A Roman soldier preparing for battle would tie on a pair of sturdy military sandals. A multi-layered sole featured uh, a pair of sturdy military sandals, a multi-layered layered rather, sole featured rugged hobnails help, helping the soldier hold his ground and stand. That's from Ephesians 6, 11, 13, 14. Paul explains this military footpour, foot wear, wear, I mean, with language from Isaiah 52, 7, which celebrates the moment when a messenger brings the news that Yahweh's battle on behalf of his people is won. Isaiah 52, 8 through 10. And peace now reigns. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. And so, we, you know, I, we don't, I, someone probably has a, at least part of one of those boots, but basically you can think of a sandal with big old metal uh, things in it to, to help you keep, so you don't lose, lose your, your footing. You have to be pretty strong to carry that, all that metal around, but proper battle footwear was important, especially for those who had to carry messages by hand from, for some distance, long before modern communication methods were available. I mean, think of, think of the military stuff going on right now where people are dro flying drones over the enemy and it's just yeah. amazing. Isaiah 52, verses 7 to 10. How wonderful it is to see a messenger coming across the mountains, bringing good news, the news of peace. He announces victory and says to Zion, your God is king. Those who guard the city are shouting, shouting together for joy. They can see with their own eyes the return of the Lord to Zion. Break into shouts of joy, you ruins of Jerusalem. The Lord will rescue his city and comfort his people. The Lord will use his holy power. He will save his people and all the world will see it from the Good News Bible. Okay, is all the world seeing the marvelous victory, victories being won by our church? In the book of Ephesians, Paul repeatedly used various expressions talking about peace. And there's a whole list of, I don't know how many there's 10 or something like that, different places where Paul talks specifically about peace in the book of Ephesians. We all have some idea what it means to wage war. I mean, that's an expression that we understand. However, how does one wage peace? Anyone figure out how you wage peace? Well, the Bible study gets, guide gives us some clues. The church is to wage peace by employing the gospel arsenal of Christian virtues, humility, patience, forgiveness, etc., and practices, Christian practices, prayer, worship. Such acts are strategic, pointing toward God's grand plan to unify all things in Christ, from our Bible study guide for Tuesday. Jim? God calls upon us to put on the armor, yeah, put on the armor, we do not want Saul's armor, but the whole armor of God. Then we can go forth to the work with hearts full of Christ-like tenderness, compassion, and love from Ellen White, Australian Union Conference record. Clear back in 1899. Yeah, think, think about the battle between David and Goliath. Yes. He basically, I mean, if you look down through history, you will learn that each nation who, con who suddenly became a great conquering nation, they did so by coming up with a new, a new weapon, basically. I mean, one of the craziest things that the, the Muslims swept across North Africa, 
up through Spain, and they were getting ready to run across, go across the Pyrenees and into France and just overrun. They thought they were going to overrun all of Europe. But Charles Martel, I think it was Charles Martel, if my memory is correct, came across the Pyrenees with his military, and they succeeded in beating the Muslims because, and most of the battles were fought with hor from, uh, from horseback. And the Christians coming down from the north had stirrups in their, on their saddles. And the Muslims had no stirrups, so it was much harder for them to stand up and carry a, a lance. And so the Christians, Christianity, Europe was saved for Christianity by, by stirrups. That's just an example, a crazy example. What other pieces of military equipment were needed for battles in Paul's day, and do we symbolic and do we symbolically need? Gary, I think that's yours. All right. Uh, Paul's shield is the large rectangular shield of a Roman legionnaire, made with wood and covered with leather. It is its edges curve inward to guard against attacks from the side. When soaked in water, shields were able to quench fiery darts. Uh, New came King James Version. E e extinguishing arrows dipped in pitch and set on fire. Paul's description of the shield of faith reflects the Old Testament use of the shield as a symbol of God who protects his people. That's from Genesis 15.1 and Psalm 3.3. 3. To take up the shield of faith, Ephesians 6.16, 6, is to enter the cosmic battle with confidence in God, who fights on behalf of believers, uh, Ephesians 6.10, supplies the finest weaponry, Ephesians 6.11.13, and who ensures the victory. Wow. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Roman battle helmet was made of iron or, or bronze. The bowl that protected the head were added a plate at the back to guard the neck. Ear guards, a brow ridge, and hinge plates, plates rather, to protect the cheeks. Now, you've probably seen those things that go like this, and they, they can pull them across in front of their... So that's yeah. what it's talking about. Gladiators. Uh, given the essential protection, the helmet provided the helmet of salvation. Ephesians 6.17 symbolizes the present salvation believers experience in solidarity with the resurrected, ascended, and exalted Christ. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. We don't know what kind of soldiers were protecting Paul, but it's possible they were wearing all this stuff yeah. as, as some of Nero's soldiers protected him. So imagine him sitting there, oh, okay, yeah, that represents, yeah, <laughs> that represents, oh, yeah. I mean, it's po very possible that he was looking at those Roman soldiers wearing all, all this stuff and figuring how that would match a, a Christian battle. Okay? Uh, we talked about the helmet of salvation. Symbolizes the present salvation believers experience in solidarity with the resurrected, ascended, and exalted Christ. That's Ephesians two, six through 10, to put on the helmet of salvation means to reject the fear of spiritual power so common in the time and instead to trust in the supreme power of Christ. And then it uh, mentions, compare Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. So we're, we're getting to the place now where we're trying to pull together the message of the, the whole book of Ephesians. And so that's what's, there's lots of references here. Yeah. Um, and I, I hope we are all able, after these descriptions, are, are able to make a sort of a mental picture of what one of these soldiers would look like, uh, standing with all his armor on and um, all of the armor that we have talked about so far has been defensive. So what military equipment was needed for the offense? From the Bible study guide, the final item of armor is, quote, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, from Ephesians 6, 17, referring to the Roman legionnaire's short, two-edged sword. 
The usual battle tactic was to throw two javelins, not mentioned by Paul, and then draw the sword and charge, employing the short sword in a thrusting motion. The believer's sword is, quote, the sword of the spirit in that it is supplied by the spirit, a weapon identified as, quote, the word of God. Paul steps forward as general and as general and issues a call to arms, speaking promises of hope and victory from the divine commander in chief. It is these promises issued in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 that constitute quote, the word of God as the lead weapon in the battle against evil. The quote, word of God then refers to the broad promises of the gospel that we find in the Bible. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. What happens to someone who receives some kind of a message and some kind of a connection to God so that he feels like the words he's speaking are God's words. Mm -hmm. Imagine having that kind of a, you know, I am the channel which God is speaking, as Paul is talking about it. He's a channel of God's message to, to the church members. So for Christians, and especially Adventists, we would say, who want to talk about peace, it might seem strange to be doing all this talking about military armor and battle. However, sometimes we need to stop and remind ourselves that this battle is real. Think of Paul's situation while he was in prison in Rome, condemned to die, death by Nero. Maybe not yet, we don't know for sure, because he actually managed to get out and was pardoned for a period of time. He was, we estimate, about two years. He got out, and so when he, after he'd written this book and the book of Colossians and Philippians, um, he traveled around some of those churches and then he was rearrested. Is it surprising that he was thinking in military terms? Paul was sure that in the end, God's cause will triumph and he wanted all of God's followers to take courage from that idea. He realized that the battles will not be easy and that the devil is a powerful foe. Now I'm gonna ask you another question. The, ro the, the roads that we know about that you can find even portions of them still there were originally in, in, in Turkey and even down into Syria and so forth, those roads were built by the Roman army. Mm. And the reason they were built by the Roman army is they wanted to be, they wanted to have a, a way that if war broke out somewhere, they could transport a lot of people fairly quickly along these roads to the different places where the war would take place. So imagine Paul, I mean, that would be the obvious place to walk. That's where everybody lives, a nice road. Why wouldn't you go on that, Not instead of beating your way through the bush? Imagine Paul, you know, marching along with whatever, and probably with two or three friends, and all of a sudden you see a Roman, whole Roman legion coming. What do you do? At the very he, least, get out of his hide, hide in the bushes? I mean, he must have had that experience on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. Paul next to his cue from the Old Testament and the story of Jehoshaphat when his nation was being invaded by the Edomites. Before going out to war, the whether literal war or spiritual war, we must arm ourselves with prayer. And if you remember the story, uh, these, this, there were three nations coming against Jehoshaphat in the, the, the small country of Judah. And he says, what are we going to do? You know, we, there's no way I can fight these huge armies that are aligned. And of course, these people intended to conquer him and put one of their people in charge of, in his place, in, the, in charge of that country. And so he called all the people, I don't know how long that took, he called all the people, says, come here, pray, this is our situation, what are we gonna do? And while they're waiting there in the, in, in the big arena in Jerusalem, someone says, oh, God has spoken to me and this is what he said. He says, go out there and do this and this and this. He says, put the, choir in front of the mil in front of the army and have them go out there and sing and pray and see what happens mm -hmm. i don't know who you would you want to be a member of the choir in that situation <laughs> i don't know but anyway that's what happened so i'm sorry go ahead jim i think it's to to cite a biblical, I'll, I'll pick that. It says, calling out to God or to the gods in prayer was a common practice on the ancient battlefield. 
to cite a biblical example following the battle exhortation, exhortation to Jehaziel. Jehaziel was the one who brought the message from God. Jehoshaphat leads, quote, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in falling down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. I mean, that's preparation for a war. While prayer is not a seventh piece of armor, it is an integral part of Paul's battle exhortation and military metaphor from our Bible study guide for Thursday. Mm. Second Chronicles 20.18 tells us exactly what happened next. Jim? Then, after hearing from the prophet regarding God's plan for Judah's victory against the invading Edomites, King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face touching the ground, and all the people bowed with him and worshiped the Lord. Good, good, nice Bible. Okay, let me ask you another question. Do you think it was customary in those days for ancient Near Eastern kings to bow down with their faces touching the ground? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Notice that Paul, first of all, prayed for the Christian church in its overall battle. But Paul's second prayer was a request for himself. Isn't, is, isn't it reasonable to ask people to pray for you if you're in prison? <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul reminded them that he was in prison in Ephesians 3, 1. Then in Ephesians 3, 7 through 13, he goes on. Carrie? I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. What was Paul's training in his childhood and youth? I didn't think that was He probably became a member of the Sanhedrin, so he was okay. pretty well educated. In and he was what, what kind of person? He was a Pharisee. Pharisee yes. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And look what he's doing now. He considered it a privilege to spread the gospel to Gentiles. How many Pharisees would be out spreading the gospel to Gentiles? It was the last thing in the world they would ever do, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And where did I stop? Was At verse the, 9. Oh, yes. Uh, I said, he knew about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and the powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Christ Jesus our Lord. In union with Christ and through our faith in him, we have the boldness to go into God's presence with all confidence. I beg you then not to be discouraged because I am suffering for you. It's all for your benefit. That's from the Good News Bible. So Paul situated in prison here. He believes that he is working for the most powerful force in the entire universe. But at the same time, he recognizes that Nero could have his head cut off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are several calls to prayer in the New Testament. What do you think of each of them? From Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, Help me against my opponent. For a long time, the judge refused to act. But at last he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because of all the trouble this widow is giving me, Amen. <laughs> I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me out. And the Lord continued, Listen to what that corrupt judge said. Now, will God not judge in favor of his own people who cry to him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will judge in their favor and do it quickly. But will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? In the Good News wow. Bible. 
That's a scary thought, huh? Mm -hmm. Will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? Uh, you want me to continue? Go ahead. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything, but in all your prayers, ask God for what you need, always asking him with a thankful heart from the Good News Bible. And Colossians 4, 2. Be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray, giving thanks to God from the Good News Bible. And last, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Be joyful always, pray at all times, be thankful in all circumstances. This is what God wants from you in your life in union with Christ Jesus, Good News Bible. Okay, so all these appeals to prayer, we could go back to the Old Testament. We've talked a little bit about Jehoshaphat, but there are other places, lots of places in the Old Testament. And now a New Testament, a lot of, these are all from, I think these are all from Paul. Um, yeah. Or Luke. It's not. Oh, well, Luke, yeah, that would be Paul's friend. Um, so, what, what's the role of pleading to God? You know, Christ in his life here on this earth, every night, I, I think about this very often, every night he would spend sometimes all night long praying to his father, committing, just committing with his father, talking back and forth, getting instructions for what was going to happen the next day. Luke 6, verse 12, talks about the whole night he prayed, getting ready the next morning to choose his disciples. Wow. Wow, that's interesting that he didn't require the sleep, or it just, God gave him the strength, and he didn't. I, I think God gave him the strength. Yes. And yet, He's supposed to be our example. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any of us that can just pray all night, you know, even stay awake enough to pray all night, and then come out and, and work all day. Ellen White puts it in these terms, an army in battle would become confused and weakened unless all worked in concert. If the soldiers should act out their own impulsive ideas without reference to each other's positions and work, they would be a collection of independent atoms. They could not do the work of an organized body. Think about times like the, uh, the Battle of Dunkirk when they came across the English Canal to, to rout out Nazism. So the soldiers of Christ must act in harmony. They alone must not be cherished. If they do this, the Lord's people in the place of being in perfect harmony of one mind, one purpose, and consecrated to one grand object will find efforts fruitless, their time and capabilities will waste it. Union is strength. A few converted souls acting in harmony, acting for one grand purpose under one head, will achieve victories at every encounter. From a special collection to some people who are trying to start a school in the South, especially for the black people. Um, in their book 121, paragraph one. Well, one might wonder why Paul was calling for arming the, for battle when he himself was an ambassador in chains. I mean, you know, yeah. ambassador? What's an ambassador supposed to do? Ambassador is supposed to be free to go anywhere. And even, I mean, we have active ambassadors and a whole embassy in China, even though we're sort of enemies of them. And we have, in other places, now some places, we don't have an embassy in North Korea. We don't have an embassy in Iran. Uh, we used to. <laughs> but, I mean, the idea is that, you know, ambassadors are supposed to be protected by rules and laws and so forth. And Paul is protected by being in prison? Well, <laughs> no, not exactly. Mm -hmm. So one might wonder why Paul was calling for arming for battle when he himself was an ambassador in chains. Did Paul think that he would escape from prison and be able to lead the charge? What is the usual work of an ambassador? Already talked about that a little bit. Paul knew that he had been fighting his whole life since his conversion on the road to Damascus for the most powerful and benevolent general in the entire universe. He did not want his friends to forget that. I mean, if you're on God's side, we mentioned, I think it's this last week, uh, what Abraham Lincoln's statement i don't want i'm not worried about having god on my if i'm if god is on my side i just want to be on his side <laughs> our world is engaged in war however 
for most of us, it seems far away. So it is, we, 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 we sit and we look at it on the television. We think, oh, that's on the other side of the world. That's not us. So it's difficult. For, or, so is it difficult or easy for us to wage peace? What efforts are Satan? I mean, you, we usually think of people really fighting for peace. If, if there's war going on, you want to stop the war, right? But this is a war going on to, to produce peace. So what, effort, what efforts are Satan making to defeat us? I mean, after all, if, you wanna, if you're in war, you want to understand something of, of the enemy's weapons and attacks and motives, right? And, and, and methods. What the fiery darts are being, what fiery darts are being hurled in our direction? Are other Christians around us suffering because they are wounded by the devil, uh, devil's darts? Can you think of a devil's dart? Well, Paul's, I'll tell you one, the most common one, the devil's first thing started the problems right in heaven, that's selfishness. Mm -hmm. If you think of yourself first before you think of anything else, you're already in trouble. Then greed. <laughs> yeah. Jim? Paul targets the fragment, the fragment of Ephesians 6, 10 to 17 with triple references to power, Ephesians 6.10, using three different words and verb, end, endura no. The verb, endunama o. Okay. To empower. Do you recognize where that, where we, that word there, what it means? Take the en off the front. And that is dunamo o. Dynamite. dynamite. That's where we get our dynamite. We're dynamite, yeah. Okay. To empower. And two nouns, krato, or ability. That's no, excuse me, strength or might. And, and that's where we get the word democrat. Yeah, which or means... Or autocrat. It means, krat means control. Yeah, to okay, rule, yeah. to rule, yeah. And that's one thing God doesn't do. Yeah, well... It's just the opposite. So if you're using the word democrat, de demo or demon, control... <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, that's what it's like sometimes. Yeah, okay. Um... Iscus, strength, might, force, or ability. The apostle used the same word, excuse me, the same words, all three in noun form at the beginning of his letter, Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, when describing God's greatness and power as revealed in Christ. Now, at the end of his letter, Ephesians 6, Paul tells the Ephesians that this power is available to them. The upper the apostle appeals to the theme of the power because he is introducing the theme of conflict, war, f fighting, and overcoming. Now, let me, uh, let me interrupt for a little bit. If your pastor was in prison and he's helping, he's, he's encouraging you to fight on the battle and he says that his general is God in heaven, wouldn't you be inclined to say, well, how come God is not getting you out of prison? Wouldn't that be sort of a, a normal response? Well, at least it would be a self-centered response, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the people who he's writing to, I'm sure they were praying for him. Sure. I'm sure they were praying for him. Mm -hmm. Okay, go but ahead. But it wasn't like being at the other end of a telephone. I mean, no. there was some, some time of lapses between the time uh, yeah. the message gets, gets to either party. Unfortunately, the Christian... Life is closely related to struggle and overcoming. True, all religions, philosophies, sciences, literature, and history, indeed, all such negatives, narratives, excuse me, narratives as evolution is, excuse me, evolutionism, Marxism, Nazism, perceive that and describe life as a struggle, as a conflict. In fact, Anyone who wants to sell a story needs a plot. It is on conflict and struggle. In such stories, the protagonist or hero is fighting against something or somebody. For instance, a protagonist fights a superpower. Another hero is struggling to overcome a black hole. And a third hero fights an incurable disease. Yeah. But the Christian struggle, Paul explains, is against the devil's schemes, Ephesians 6.11 of the NIV. 
The war is described, excuse me, the war he describes is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the worldly force, excuse me, world forces of his darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 12 from the New American Standard Bible. See also Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, Ephesians 2, 6, Ephesians 3, 10. The spiritual battle in the heavenly place, in the heavenly realms, is direct and crucial repercussions in on our life. If we directly involve, excuse me, we are directly involved in the war and we must pick a side. However, let me interrupt for a second. Can you think of an example in the Bible where the councils in heaven directly involved one person's life here on this earth? Jim, this should be your theme. Well, that's what Jesus was. Well, but what, think yeah. about the story of Job. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's right. their oldest. That's the first story we have recorded in the Bible. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right up front. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. Um, we are directly involved in this one. We must pick a side. However, go ahead. However, in the uh, uh, entire epistle, Paul explains that we are not involved in this war simply because two superpowers are fighting and we are innocent collateral victims entangled or caught up in the battle against our will. I like that uh, term entang uh, uh, entangled. Uh, um, collateral victims. Yeah. It, 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 a person does, we, suffers consequences, but they're not uh, because of, well, Jesus. Yeah. He did nothing wrong, and yet he's collateral damage. Yeah. And he show, that whole demonstration is to show how evil works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might seem like we're fighting a battle on our own with little help. However, remember that the war began in heaven, not here on this earth. It is all about God. And God came to this earth as a human being and lived that remarkable life, which ended in his death for us. And I like to repeat that idea. You know, we have a choice. We can live a life like he lived or we'll die the death like he died, separated from God. I don't, I don't know how you can make it much simpler and more straightforward than that. God just can't take to heaven people who are misbehaving and rebellious and he just can't. Well, that would be hell for them. Yeah. And so he's not, he's not good. Nobody's not just, not just hell for them, but be hell for everybody else. Heaven is self-selected. Mm -hmm. Either choose that you want to live in harmony with the way the universe is designed to operate or attempt to go your own self-centered way and <laughs> his, you burn his death. <laughs> okay, Carrie. Now, Helen White there. Helen White there, yes. Many look on this conflict between Christ and Satan as having no special bearing on their own life. And for them, it has little interest. But within the domain of every human heart, this controversy is repeated. Never does one leave the ranks of evil for the service of God without encountering, encountering rather the assaults of Satan. The enticements which Christ resisted were those that we find it so difficult to withstand. They were urged upon him in as much greater degree as his character is superior to ours. With the terrible weight of the sins of the world upon him, Christ withstood the test upon appetite, upon the love of the world, and upon that love of display which leads to presumption. These were the temptations that overcame Adam and Eve and that so readily overcome us. Okay, this I'm going to, yeah, Desire of Ages, 116, 170. Thank you. Think about that. The devil must have known from the, I mean, from the moment, even before Jesus was born, from the experience of Joseph and of Mary and so forth, this is Christ that's going to be born here. And the devil, I'm sure that he and his forces must have had conferences every day. Okay, we've got, to, we've got to kill this child or we've got to do something. We've got to prevent him. We've got to get him to sin. We've got to, we've got to do something to stop this guy. Whew. It's hard to imagine. 
Okay. Um, from the Bible Study Guide. In his extensive work, Systematic Theology, Norman Gully highlights that Christian theology has generally missed the theme of the cosmic conflict or great controversy. See Norman Gully, Systematic Theology, The Church and the Last Things. Um, while for other Christians, the great controversy, the spiritual cosmic conflict between God and the evil forces of Satan, is one of the details more related to theodicy. For Ellen G. White and Seventh-day Adventists, the great controversy is the overarching doctrine that integrates all the other doctrines, not only system systematically, but historically. For Seventh-day Adventists, the theme of the great controversy is not only a system of doctrines, but a story, the story of God. It is the story of His loving act of creation, of our rebellion against Him, of His sacrificial love for us, of His direct intervention in the history of our world through incarnation, of His death on the cross, resurrection and ascension, of His desire and work to restore our relationship with Him of his restoring the unity and love in humanity through the church, of his promises to put an end to the story of sin and evil, and of his promise to usher us into his eternal joy and peace. For this reason, Seventh-day Adventists have articulated the great controversy theme as Fundamental Belief 8, voted by the General Conference in 1980. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that, all because we've got to watch the clock here. We're running out of time. All humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, His law, and His sovereignty over the universe. This conflict originated in heaven when a created being endowed with freedom of choice and self-exaltation became Satan, God's adversary, and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God and humanity, this disordering of the created world and its eventual devastation at the time of the Global Fund as presented in the historical account of Genesis 1 through 18. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universal conflict out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in the, this controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the holy loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. That is the core idea of the great controversy which our entire theology is based on. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for giving us this privilege of understanding these core doctrines, this core theme, these core messages that so many people don't understand it all. Help us to find better ways to spread the news about them to others, to live that, to live them and to preach them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.